Next, I would like to call upon stage Dr. Neil Smith, who is the professor at UCSD and also a CIO at FalconWiz. Hello again, everyone. Let's see. OK. So today, I'm just going to give a brief about the way that uh, we're seeing uh, emerging of new technology and spatial computing, com computing, particularly in academic research and cultural heritage and AEC industry. Uh, just to give you a little background about myself, I've been working in kind of these immersive type environments uh, since the 2000s. Uh, here's me when I was my, my much younger self um, in what we call an immersive cave environment where actually before really there was good VR headsets like the Oculus or even AR that was really um, usable. We were really trying to create these immersive environments in these cave type systems. And you can imagine these are limited to those that can afford these million dollar facilities to create these type of environments. And really I think one of the nice things about VR and AR is it's really democratize the accessibility to immersive experiences um, that was never possible before. Um, here's just, uh, just to get an idea that digital twins and the idea of spatial computing has been around for a long time. Uh, long before VR and AR were really good technologies, people were trying to get AR and VR working inside their systems. Uh, and for myself, um, this really was an important part because uh, as an archaeologist, um, we want to preserve the archaeological data, and we have a significant problem. I call this the fundamental program that problem that I share with all of my students, that archaeology, in a sense, is a destructive science, right? We're constantly destroying the very data that we're excavating, and whatever we don't record is lost forever. And so um, for me, as an archaeologist, the better ways that I can find to digitize and preserve and restudy and visualize my data, the more I'm preserving my archaeological site. Uh, and for so those of you that may be wondering, okay, so what is a cyber archaeologist? This is how I define it to my students. And a cyber archaeologist is one who employs digital and computational methods within an immersive collaborative environment to study the archaeological record. And I'm highlighting here immersive collaborative environment because I say this is where we are now. Um, for the last 10 years, We've really been developing technologies of in when it comes to acquisition and merging digital and computational methods. Where I feel that we are now, this next generation, the next 10 years, I see us really moving into how to create these immersive environments in which we can do stuff like study the archaeological record or have a digital laboratory that we can do analyses and studies or what we saw Raj was sharing about um, for having these laboratories to study plants, right? I think we're now at the stage where we're trying to ask ourselves, now that we have all this massive big data and we're generating more and more data every year, how can we capitalize on this data, curate it, and, ev and eventually be able to use it for analysis and dissemination and sharing to others? Um, here's also just how I define spatial computing for academia. It's the process and tools used to capture, process, and interact with 3D data. And really that's what I th see as the key to spatial computing is this ability to process and interact with our 3D data. Um, and finally, one other thing about spatial computing is there's really two parts to it. There's both the immersion and the convergence. And uh, um, I think I'll skip this slide. Uh, what do I mean by convergence is that um, convergence is really where we bring this real and the digital into a new reality. Being able to access XR-enabled devices such as VR or a pair of AR smart glasses within the real world. And I talked about this in the panel, the idea that we want to create grounded reality, right? That we're actually overlaying or converging real, like our physical reality with all this new data that's actually just as real and just as important as what we s physically see. Just imagine the fact that right now we have um, wa radio waves, Wi-Fi signals penetrating through our bodies. Um, we don't see this, it's invisible to us, but um, if we want to model and understand how to set up a Wi-Fi network within this room, being able to visualize and see how we set up that data becomes really important. With AR and with kind of this idea of spatial computing, we could actually begin to visualize how to set up these systems. And I'd say there's kind of four key components to enabling convergence in what we can call spatial computing and the metaverse. Uh, the first one, is, of course, is digital twins. That is the ability to overlay an architect's design or an as-built scan or a real-world one-to-one site 
um, within our same physical environment. And this is something that we've been talking about a lot today. But also there's other key ingredients that I see. One of them is um, integrating all different types of wearables and IoT into the space. So digital twins are, not, are living data. They're living um, spatial computing. It's not just a static model that was captured 10 years ago, but it's constantly can be updated and integrated with all different types of sensors and data. So I really think a key component to creating spatial computing is this convergence of wearables and IoT into our system. A third one is what are called global cloud anchors. Um, and this is something that Niantic and um, Snapdragon Spaces is really kind of pushing forward. Even uh, Microsoft HoloLens had their Azure spatial markers. And the idea between anchors is the idea that I can walk in this space and I can place an anchor of some note or some object in this corner of the room. And then someone else can put on their AR headset and they can actually take a mapping of the room because all these head headsets now does inside out tracking and by their location be able to detect, okay, I'm standing in this particular space. Then they can go to the cloud and find somewhat of a fingerprint representing where they are in that space and be able to pull down whatever the other person posted in their area. Um, and this is gonna become really important when we try to create this convergence is we have to solve the problem of how to anchor the digital world in the physical world and tie those two together. And really global cloud anchors is a solution to that. And finally, one thing that I'm really glad to hear is uh, most people are not happy with these cartoonish avatars that you get from you know, Meta Horizons or a lot of the kind of experiences we see now in VR. I think that especially when it comes to enterprise or if I'm teaching in front of classes, I don't wanna be a cartoon in front of my students, right? I wanna look as realistic as I can to my students. And so really uh, a new technology that's really emerging is what are called MetaHumans and Epic Games uh, acquired the company MetaHumans a while ago, and they're able to create really truly photorealistic avatars that can really express the facial cues and eye contact that I think is critical for being able to merge these two worlds together. Um, so uh, just talking about digital twins a little bit more, um, I, there's uh, um, Joseph Bradley, who's the head of Neom's kind of metaverse vision uh, in Saudi Arabia came up with the term cognitive cities. And I think that really explains this convergence that we're, talk that we're seeing now. The idea that a digital twin is you know, this constantly updated living streaming data of IoT sensors, but it's still in a sense not intelligent, right? It's just collecting and storing data. A cognitive city leverages this data, collects it, and uses it immediately to train AI agents to autonomously predict and adapt to the needs of people living within a city or living within a building. So imagine you have data collecting all of your generators or all of your servers in a building. That data is not just being stored somewhere for a human being to look at, but it's being stored and being used to train an, an AI um, agent to actually know how to detect when, let's say, one of those generators is starting to decay and needs to be replaced, and it can actually predict those things and provide that information. So that's the difference between what I like to call a cognitive city compared to a digital twin. And really I see the, the key next step is this generation of connectivity, right? Everything having a wireless solution, having both the edge RECs and localization all happening at once. Um, and that brings me to just talking a little bit about Falcon Viz. So Falcon Viz, we do um, aerial mapping and survey, but really we started to see that it's more than that. We need to provide that final solution of visualization. So we would create these amazing models like you can see here, and this is not um, an aerial drone video. This is actually a full reconstruction, and it just shows the level of detail that you can capture now using modern technologies like photogrammetry that's down to the precision of one centimeter, even five millimeters in accuracy. And so um, what we started doing is started asking, okay, how can we create kind of the, the open metaverse for academia research? And we came up with the idea of what we call the CyberArk Warehouse. <coughs> and the idea is to build this kind of open metaverse for academia and research. And we're actually working with Epic Games to create this um, baseline software that anyone can use to basically step into the world of VR and AR and bring in your data, be able to study it, um, be able to um, research with other researchers, even though you may be remotely disconnected. Um, 
and here's just a video of um, one of our early builds of the Cyberarc warehouse. And you can see that uh, um, it's fully in VR, and here you're actually in this museum, and you can interact with the artifacts. You can pick up the artifacts. Um, uh, you can, um, of course, see your hands tracked, your feet tracked, and your body. Um, you can um, go ahead, like here, you'll see that uh, you can actually pick up this object. You can interact with it. You can scale it. And uh, I won't show more of this video, but you can even go in and pull data down from the cloud and stream it right into your environment. So you can imagine you have an archaeologist um, in uh, South America that's just scanned an artifact. They can upload it to the cloud, and then you can, in VR, in your nice, comfy, air-conditioned uh, room, pull that data right into your environment and begin studying it and analyzing it. So it allows us to do these kind of remote type of laboratories and research which especially has become a need now that we have issues like COVID and others that quite often restrict us from being able to travel like we used to before. Um, and then finally, I mentioned the idea of metahumans, right? That uh, really, if we want to create a true um, kind of usable and um, lifelike avatars, we need to move to what are called metahumans. And this is a metahuman of an archeologist called Aviram Biran. He passed away in 2008. And we actually re fully reconstructed him from a single image. So we had one image. We used that and DeepFace AI to extract his facial structure. And then we threw it, we threw it into another AI using metahumans and created a very lifelike character. Then we took uh, um, a natural language processing and we trained, we took an hour lecture that he gave and we, tr we used that to pre-train um, the dial uh, pre-trained a language learner so that we could actually recreate his accent and his voice and he has this very thick Israeli accent and we were able to perfectly be able to reconstruct that. And then finally we used NVIDIA's Omniverse AI technology called Audio to Face where we actually took the audio that we generated and we were able to generate the lifelike animations. And so here you can kind of see a final reconstruction of Aviram, and I think this is just the start. We're actually moving on to looking at more important people, uh, like Gandhi. We're actually working now with my students to reconstruct Gandhi. And uh, just a note of that, um, I was speaking with the provost of UCSD yesterday, and she's like, oh, so you're making a deep fake. And I'm like, well, you know, deep fakes are kind of a negative way of looking at it. And I came up with the idea, why don't we call them deep respect, you know, because Gandhi, Martin Luther King, these are people that we really respect. And so most of us here may have actually got to meet them or see them in person or were alive when they lived. But there's a lot of people in here that have never met them and just see these videos black and white of these people. What if we can recreate them and let this generation be impacted and inspired by them like we were in our generation? And that's really the idea behind creating these, what I call deep respect avatars in comparison to these deep fakes. Um, and then finally, um, I won't go into this much detail, but uh, if you have a chance, please come to my demo where I'm showing how we can use um, the metaverse and use AR and photogrammetry and digital twins to fully interact with our models in AR. And so you'll get to see it more over there. So I think I will end with that. Thank you very much. Thank you.